for remembering. <laughs> So all that, all that, all that, and then neat. <laughs> so we, so this other what counts is again anything we're doing above rest. So uh, even some of you, when you're sitting, probably during your Zoom meetings, you twitch, right? You so you kind of move around a little bit. If you have, you know, people in your life that move all seem to be moving all around, uh, even when they're seated, that's also part of that thermogenesis. And thermogenesis refers to the production of heat. So when we do muscle skeletal muscle work uh, in our bodies, uh, you probably notice that your body temperature goes up a little bit, and you. You, uh, oftentimes, depending on the intensity or the duration of exercise or movement that we're doing, we often sweat. And the goal of that is to cool ourselves down because we have this thermogenesis effect going on. So that's another way we can move. And then we have definitions uh, of exercise. An exercise, the formal definition is any type of voluntary physical activity that's planned, structured, and usually repetitive in nature, and is often done with the intention of improving either performance outcomes or health outcomes. So that would be exercise. And then we have another type of movement, which is not limited to just our young, young people in our lives, is play, right? And play is unstructured. So it's just going out and just doing whatever. It doesn't necessarily have an outcome. Fun could be the outcome of it. But again, it's something above rest. So we have a lots of different opportunities for what technically counts as movement. Um, what's interesting is um, some of you uh, maybe have seen you're supposed to exercise a certain amount each week. If anyone's ever seen the number 150 minutes of exercise for adults per week, 60 minutes of exercise for children each day. Anyone ever seen those recommendations? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I find that when people know those exist from large agencies like the World Health Organization or the Centers for Disease Control, and they see them and then they don't meet them, they feel guilty. Right, they feel like, oh my gosh, I, I'm a below average. I am not doing what we're I'm supposed to be doing. So true. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it it is. It, you know, we see these mm -hmm. uh, you know, recommendations for adults and and then we think, oh, I, I didn't I only did, you know, 10 minutes of walking today up my stairs in my building, so I fell short. But the, the something I always invite students and everyone to do is, where did that recommendation come from, right? So what is that based on? And who is the recommendation coming to? And interestingly enough, not to bore you with the initial research, but a, group, a, a researcher, he actually initially started out as a polio researcher working on the polio vaccine, and then started looking at mortality statistics um, in some large epidemiological studies uh, by the name, a gentleman by the name of Pfaffenberger. And Pfaffenberger and his group started to happen to collaborate a lot of data on the association of minutes of activity, uh, how, so how, how much people moved, and their mortality. Mortality is death. So they suggested, they saw, there was a point where the more minutes, uh, uh, accumulated minutes a week, and it happened to be about 30 minutes a day, that people moved on an average of five days a week, they happened to decrease their risk of death, their mortality risk, by a significant portion in their group they looked at. And then there were another uh, number of other studies over the years that looked at this. But in the nine, this was going on in the 60s, 70s, 80s. So in the 90s, some large health organizations stepped forward and said, well, I think that 30 minutes a day by five days a week, that sounds pretty good. So let's put that out. So that's where our 150 minutes a day come from. What many people I sense are interested in is how do I, I kind of diminish my risks of some of these health conditions that are associated with not moving. So cardio, how do I, uh, you know, lessen my chances of metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes, or improve my cardiovascular um, health, or how about my mental health with movement? So how do I, you know, support my dopamine and my serotonin um, in my brain, which makes my body feel good? Um, the that doesn't have any strong backing of it has to be 150 minutes each week. And so again, um, something, you know, a constraint that's been placed on many of us 
that if we look at the original research, it's really comes down what it's done for much of the exercise world is sort of medicalized or given the idea that there's this dose response. If you do a certain amount of activity, you're guaranteed this response. And the, the long story short is it's not that simple, right? It's so individual and there are so many things to think about. So back, we go back to this idea of, well, what can we do more of? Could we move more? And then how do the benefits end up uh, coming, be, becoming more part of the individual's experience? So I open it to the chat. What are some barriers to your own movement? Or if you want to answer for a friend, because you don't want to share your own. <laughs> never, <laughs> never, yeah, never me. It's always my friend. Yes. So what are some barriers to movement? Whatever, based on anything above rest. So what are some barriers? Anyone want to throw this out in the chat? Okay, are you great. Lazy, sitting too long for work, sitting in front of a computer all day. And feel okay, free to unmute Allison. also if you wanted to just yell it out on the the um zoom sitting in front of the oh yeah we got that one injuries Injury. i mentioned before i'm just gonna be a hundred percent honest i mentioned to cast sometimes i feel like my body isn't attractive enough to hit the gym and get that movement in so it keeps me away too tired i'm not healthy enough to work out <laughs> yeah motivation Thanks, injury Jennifer. For a while, we didn't want to get close to anybody who might be sick. That's a good, that's true. Exhausted. I think I, I, think I heard sleeping. another injury um, share injury. of yeah. injury. Yep. Ex exhausted for not sleeping well. Jason, attend my May session, and we'll still talk about that one, about sleep <laughs> and exercise. Priorities. Yes, or many other things taking priorities. Yeah, awesome. Uh, great. So um, all really important. And thank you for sharing all those things, because those barriers uh, at the end of the day, someone else can say, oh, well, it, that's easy. There's lots of other, you know, you just make movement your priority. Right. But if you're um, Dagmar and sharing, but other things take priority, that barrier is very paramount to you and real to you in your experience. So for someone to diminish that, it, that's not the way we need to go. And oftentimes in that popular media, right, when we look at, oh, it's just easy, just do this or just do that. Um, but it's really coming down to, to establishing what where we are. For barriers, uh, what I find uh, also is, are these barriers real or, or perceived in your own experience, right? So it, what do I mean by that? So if I say um, that I don't have time to move in my schedule, um, is that real or is that perceived? So for one, I'd need to start out thinking about what is movement to me? So what does that mean in my, in my uh, desire to do something? or more or less of something. And then if it's time, um, it might require to do some tracking of my day to look for little spaces where I could insert movement. And that could be that in between your Zoom meetings, uh, you're uh, only scheduling things that have 10 minutes, you know, you're allowing 10 minutes in between and you're getting up and you're doing a wall sit or you're doing some body weight squats, or you're doing some stretches, um, you know, and, and then you are, your, your real and perceived has changed because you perceive you don't have time, but then sometimes maybe someone looking at that with you would be supportive in identifying that there is time, um, but it's just sort of rearranging some things. So are the barriers real or perceived? Um, looking also, and we're going to do today, we're going to look at a, a model of goal setting with internal versus external obstacles. Um, and then something called uh, our locus of control is also is a consideration when we look at barriers to movement or barriers for any behavior change in our lives. And that's, do we feel that we have the tools in our toolbox to make change, right? So that's what we're doing today. You're here gathering some information um, and putting some tools in your toolbox that you can implement in your own lives to possibly do more or less of something, which we happen to be talking about movement. So my guess would be um, if we surveyed our group and said, are you goal oriented? Uh, probably most people would respond, yes. I'm probably, you know, feel pretty goal oriented in your lives or, 
do you, have you goal set in your past? Have you set any types of goals? My, my sense would be probably most of you have. Um, you may even uh, support others like our students or in your leadership positions at SMC in how to set goals. So um, a very common acronym in our goal setting is SMART. We see that SMART model of goal setting. Um, and I, I would like to talk a little bit about um, when, at least the data on goal setting, is that most people, when they set goals, they don't fulfill their goals. Right? Um, that uh, especially New Year's resolution goals, the statistics of people who actually fulfill those, uh, University of Scranton's, they're about 20 years into following their New, New Year's resolutions, goal setting fulfillments, they get about 8% of individuals who set New Year's resolutions actually fulfilling them. So it doesn't feel good not to be successful, right? It doesn't feel good at all. So what is it about goal setting? Could we do some pre-work before we even get to establishing what our plan of action is gonna be? And I, I liken this analogy to if we were gonna build a house and we uh, chose a place and we didn't take time to grade our pad and set a really good foundation, we kind of just thought, yeah, we got the scrap material, we'll just throw a bunch of stuff together. We just wanna get the walls up and get it painted so it looks beautiful on the outside, right? But if we don't establish that foundation, as we start adding layers to that, more than likely, we're not going to have a steady st structure or we're going to have collapse in one area or we're going to have compromise in one area. So this uh, example I'd like to share with you today is a way of doing the pre-work before we even think about the action part of this. Um, also looking at what type of goals we're setting. Um, so the the second line is types of goals uh, being outcome goals, process goals, and performance goals. And I'd have to say um, in the, the work uh, that I've done with individuals with goal setting, many times people pick outcome goals. And so an example of an outcome goal in sports uh, would be for a team to say, we want to win the championship. Right. Or for um, a, a student athlete to say, I want to get a scholarship to a division one school. Right. That would be an outcome goal. And part of that outcome or a characteristic of outcome goals is that they there's a lot in that goal that is not in your locus of control, meaning there are other people competing for that same thing. Uh, oftentimes there are, so, so like if you're working with students that want to transfer and they say, I want to get into whatever, Sherry Lee Lewis has UCLA, to get into UCLA, and they say, that's what I want to do, that's their outcome goal, you say, that's great, but there are, there's a selection committee, there's a process, and however many thousands of other students competing for that acceptance. But that would be an example of an outcome goal. Doesn't mean it's not a, a goal that we could be working towards. But many times people, they, they select these outcome goals and already they have taken on something that may be out of the, oops, out of the realm of um, realistic or out of the realm of small successes leading to, if you use the staircase model of goal setting, we do step-by-step, step, right? We're progressing towards this thing that's at the top of the stairs that we're working towards. And so we can stop and think, okay, the last goal that I took on, what type of goal was it? Was it this outcome goal? Was it a process goal? So the process goal would be that step-by-step. -step. I say, all right, uh, I'm working towards um, this in maybe in, a, in your career, or let's say movement. Um, I would like to walk uh, five miles in a certain amount of time. Uh, and right now I can barely walk a mile. So I'm going to, break that down over maybe six months. And I'm going to make a plan or my process of how to work towards that, that whole goal, that, that goal of five miles. Um, so that would be a process goal. And uh, often with our behavior goals that are related to our health and wellness, process goals are pretty important because we know that things like increasing our movement have other behaviors that are often attached to them. So could we break that apart and then making it more manageable uh, into little pieces that we're working towards, they all come together and coalesce to reach that, to fulfill our overall goal. 
And then our performance goals would be measurable. So uh, back to that one of five miles in a certain amount of time or running a mile in 12 minutes, if that was your goal, uh, you would establish what you can do now, which maybe is walk a mile in 20 minutes. And then I have an objective measure. I can use my, I can use my timer to know how long is it taking me to do that? It's not how to, how I feel might be one thing, but it gives me objective information. And it, same with um, when individuals uh, come to me and say, I want to lose weight. I say, well, okay, let's talk about body composition, what we're made of. We're made of muscle and we're made of fat. So let's measure that. We need an objective measurement, not just how we feel or how we think we look, but what is our body composition? What percentage is that? So we can do a skin fold caliper. We can do a DEXA scan. We can measure that. And then over time, as we change other behaviors that are related to that, whether it's moving or eating or stress management or our sleep behaviors, we can reassess that goal in let's say eight weeks or reassess that measure, that objective measure of body composition. And that would be that performance goal. So something would have an objective measure. Um, and each, you know, we're, we're kind of, I could sort of live in the health and wellness world. So my examples may be specific to that, but there could be performance measures um, across all different aspects of behavior. So making sure our goal is matched to what, what we're working to build on our foundation is important. Motivation is something else. I hear people say, well, yeah, I, I made that, you know, I started the new exercise program and I was so motivated for the first two weeks <laughs> and then, whew, right? And then something changed. Um, so motivation actually has a definition. It's, de it's defined as the direction and the intensity of effort. So the direction of effort comes down to that goal setting. So are we working towards something that's specific to where we want to go with that? An example would be if, if you wanted to become a, um, a faster swimmer, um, but you don't go to the pool, you only run, more than likely the direction of that motivation is going to diminish over time because you're not going to see progress in your swimming. Um, no offense to any triathletes, but that was something when I was working with triathletes, they would run a lot, they would ride their bikes a lot, but they would always say, I want to be a better swimmer. And I would say, well, how much do you swim? And they'd say, oh, I don't like to swim. And I say, well, okay, um, you know, that we might need to have that specificity in your goal plan uh, if you're working towards, a tri working towards a triathlon. So direction is important. And then the intensity of effort is the how hard part. And so that's an important part uh, when we look in at movement. Uh, uh, we often measure intensity by uh, how hard we perceive we're working. It's called rate of perceived exertion. Or we can measure like some of you probably have smart devices. You wear your, your Fitbits or your smartwatches and you measure your heart rate and how, how fast your, how many beats your heart minute how many times your heart beats per minute. And that can be a measure of intensity. Um, we can also use other measures of intensity. Um, you know, how hard we're breathing. So our ventilation rate during movement could give us a measure of that. And there's different percentages. We talk about low intensity, moderate intensity, and high intensity. And that really suggests that how um, challenging is that movement to your body and that it has to overcome moving from rest to say doing uh, a Pilates or a yoga class might be considered more low to moderate intensity uh, versus if we go on a walk, it could be moderate intensity, but that same walk, if we are walking up a hill or if we're doing the Culver stairs or we're going for a hike in one of the canyons can quickly move from a moderate intensity effort to a high intensity. So now it can start going up a uh, more intense. So the intensity also comes down to when we make a behavior change, is that intensity sustainable? So, right, we're all excited in that first couple of weeks, but then life kicks in. Or um, I worked with someone who started a behavior modification program when they were on holiday. So they had two weeks off. They made, implemented all these behavior changes and then came back to reality, which was their work schedule, their life schedule, and went, I can't do it. I can't maintain it. So the intensity was a mismatch to what the other demands were in their environment. So we, you know, we, we think about that as well, direction and intensity of effort. So part of that is really kind of gathering the data initially and deciding where are we starting before we take action. 
So I'm really curious has any, if anyone has ever seen this model or uses this model of uh, goal setting. It's, it's actually called mental contrasting. And the researcher that has presented this model is uh, a woman by the name of Gabriel Ottingen. And I'll put the link, uh, maybe when we're done or I can share my slide deck, I put a link to a couple of her talks um, on this model of goal setting and it's called the WHOOP model, W-O-O-P. Um, there's actually a WHOOP app. If you're an app person, uh, there's a free app that you can download onto your phone and you can actually do this goal setting on a daily basis. So this can be used for setting your daily tone. This could be used for something you'd want to do in a month. This could be something long term, a long term behavior change that you're looking at over time. And what's unique about her um, research in how she's, how she's implemented this model is uh, she suggests that many of us are too lofty in our goals, right? It's, I mean, I remember as a kid, someone saying, well, what is it that shoot for the stars or shoot for the top of the world. And at least if you fail, you'll be among the stars or something like that, right? And you're like- Shoot for oh. the stars and settle on the moon or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, something, Our you know, son, like, super, I don't remember. Yeah, but something that leads you to believe go big or go home, right? So like, and, and her suggestion or observations initially were that people go too big and people that were really fixated on this very lofty goals were often not the ones fulfilling their goals. So how do we, and, and that was because there was oftentimes a mismatch in that motivational model of direction by intensity of effort. The direction was there, but it was mismatched with the intensity. And so it didn't lead to someone being able to sustain the behavior change that they had initiated. So she uh, presented this idea um, and has it has been replicated in many different behavior change models um, of first starting with thinking about what is your wish? So what do you want to accomplish? And it would be, what do I want to accomplish today? So if you're using the app, you get up in the morning and say, what do I want to accomplish today? What's my wish for today, right? Um, and so if you want to kind of start thinking about that as we're going through it, we'll, we'll, we can do a little um, kind of plug into this model and, and see what you think. So what do you want to accomplish? And then the outcome, the O, is what would be the results or what would be the best results of accomplishing your wish? So how would you feel? Okay. So let's say we're talking about movement. Um, today, my goal is to move a total of 30 minutes in my day. That's what I want to accomplish. How will I feel? Uh, I'll feel like, you know, maybe not so sore at the end of the day, or maybe not so um, rigid or inflexible, or I'll feel like I really accomplished something today. So that would be my outcome. Here's the unique part of her model is the second O is obstacle. What is the main obstacle in you that might prevent you from accomplishing your wish. So what is the internal obstacle to this? And this is unique because oftentimes when we talk about obstacles like the barriers to movement that you were so generous in sharing your ideas about, many of those are things in our environment which constrain our movement, right? I have to do 77 things, that's outside of me, right? Or um, time, time is, technically outside of me. So what is it in you that may be the main obstacle to your wish, right? that may prevent you from accomplishing your wish? And then is her P in the WHOOP model is what is going to be the plan to tackle that obstacle? So if that was my, what do I wanna accomplish is moving a total of 30 minutes in my day, how will I feel about that? What will be my best result is I'll feel accomplished, like I did more than I did last week. Um, so I'll feel good or maybe mentally I'll feel clear. I won't feel so kind of, you know, fatigued. It'll make me feel more energized. And then if I think about what is the obstacle inside myself? Well, maybe it's that I don't feel that that's sufficient. Right. I feel that I need to move more than 30 total minutes in a day for it to be worth it. Maybe that's my internal obstacle is how I perceive that. So what's the effective plan to tackle that? So if 
that thought process starts to come into my mind that it's not even worth it. What difference does 30 minutes of total movement make? It's not going to make me an Olympic athlete. So who cares? Or who's going to know that I don't do it? What will I take? How will I take action on that obstacle? So this mental contrasting is a lot of uh, about self-talk and about reframing some of the barriers that may be real, but are often perceived and end up becoming um, limitations to what we want to do with that wish. Um, so I find this is interesting. So if we like, to, we'll take a maybe a couple minutes uh, for you to think about if you were just sketching on the you know side of your notepad or even doing your own start to this process, could you envision yourself using something like this either in, on a daily or a weekly if you're you know setting up your week plan? Um, what do you want to accomplish this week? Right. So what's your wish for that week? And based on what it is, whatever that is that you choose, it can be anything. What would be the best result of fulfilling that wish? Right. How would you feel at the end of the week when you look back on that and you reflect back on that experience? And then there's your key in in that um, other. O. what is that main internal obstacle that may prevent you from that? No, no one else but you. Right. In that locus of control, um, what do you feel that you need to have in order to accomplish that wish? And then what's going to be your plan? Um, so, again, it's there's no one answer, um, but that's the beautiful thing is this gives us kind of a framework, a little template to work through. And whether it's related to any behavior, this isn't specific just to movement. She didn't, she actually hasn't done a lot of exercise specific um, research, but it has been extrapolated to other environments and, and been used. Um, but how, how could you use that? Um, so again, I can share my slide deck if you want to do more with that and the link uh, where you can listen to her talk about um, kind of how she arrived at that. Any comments? Any questions yet? Anything? And again, please feel free to unmute yourself and join the conversation here. All right. No? No. So uh, just another um, kind of behavior uh, um, resource. Uh, again, you know, there isn't one specific, so this dose response idea of you do this much of this and this is what's going to happen, or are there guarantees that if you do move in your life that you'll have reduced uh, morbidity would be the health conditions that go along with uh, low movement or certain amounts of movement or the mortality, does it guarantee you anything? No, it doesn't. Um, so looking at uh, long-term uh, data uh, is sometimes informative. Again, not necessarily giving us answers, but looking at patterns. And there is um, a, something called the National Weight Loss Registry. Uh, it's a website where you can look at all of their data that is updated each year. Um, James Hill, uh, he's University of Colorado and Rena Wing, um, they have, uh, they started the National Weight Loss Registry in the early 90s. They've now collected data on over 10,000 people um, who have, on average, um, lost 66 or more pounds of weight um, and maintained that weight loss or that weight change for more than five years. And there is a wide variability in their subjects um, as far as who is contributing their data. Uh, and it's data looking at behavior change or behavior modification. So, you know, when you're looking at, well, what is the one answer? What do I need to do? Just tell me. Uh, I, unfortunately, there isn't one thing to tell you. Uh, it's a constellation of different things and interactions with things, which makes us the complex and amazing humans that we are. But when we can look at this much data together, sometimes it can give us um, different, we can see patterns. And w the reason I share this is going along with that WHOOP model is that um, the framework uh, and participants share that they took time to make uh, these process goals uh, that were happened over a very long period of time and were very dynamic in nature reminds us that 
being fluid in these processes. And if it doesn't work the first time, it's just a learning process, right? And we go back and that's really where we learn is we reflect on the experience, we retool some things, and then we go back in and we re-implement our action plan. So that is a, a pattern you do see in the National Weight Loss Registry data is that spending time to establish that foundation before you implement change was part of the success for many of the participants who have reported their their data in this particular um, collaborative um, that they've they put together. So I, I just find that's interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. I love how you bring all the actual um, research and everything into this. Oh, thanks. Well, I, you know, um, like someone asked like 10,000 steps. Does anyone know where that- I was gonna <laughs> ask you about that when you were mentioning like people said stuff about how many hours. I always hear 10,000. Yeah. So um, in, in, the, in the 1970s, when Tokyo hosted the Olympics, um, there was, uh, that's when, um, as part of a kind of health campaign in Tokyo, a pedometer was developed. And um, the, the word, the translation in um, the native, the individual who developed it was 10,000 steps is the translation, because that became the community goal for moving 10,000 steps. Yes, people have replicated that over time. Jim Hill's actually done a lot of um, studies to say, is 10,000 steps the key? Um, looking at uh, communities like the Amish communities uh, that move more than 10,000 steps a day, can we say that that's the key to their success as far as low incidence for a lot of these chronic disease or mismatched diseases of environment? Probably not. Uh, it's probably a combination of many things, but it is interesting to look at that. Um, and 10,000 steps for someone may be completely unrealistic. I mean, it may be overwhelming. Uh, but for some people, you may already move more than 10,000 steps if you do uh, public transportation in your commute, if you have a dog, uh, if you, you know, move around in your environment. So what's measuring those steps? So yeah, things like that. Deborah, go ahead. Yeah, I had heard recently that that the 10,000 steps was just a, a marketing flaw. Uh, a ploy for uh, the Japanese to sell pedometers. They created this little device and they wanted to sell them. So they came out with, they generated this data, whatever to say that 10,000 step was the magic number. You're you exactly you about that. Yeah, exactly. It was it was really it was the theme or kind of the the title of the pedometer. It was the community health health initiative was 10,000 steps and it was, hey, if people are coming here for the Olympics, we want to show everyone we're an active culture. Um, we take health as a priority. And so, yes, that's exactly what it came from. Um, and like, you know, I said, it, it has served as the baseline for consequent studies in the years following. But yeah, it's not the magic number. There's probably people that are going, I do more than 10,000 steps a day. And what has it gotten me? Right. So yeah, you're exactly right. We really need to look at um, where that comes from. So thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. You know, Cass, on the, I'm sure people are more advanced than me in terms of technology, but I found on the iPhone where it shows like this week or this day, how many steps you've done. And I walk, I used to walk a lot and I would find 10,000 very difficult, but I would look at at least the day that I walked the most and try to always keep up with that. And that helped me personally, instead of trying to always get that 10,000, just try to always do whatever my best, my personal best is try to stay around. I'm, I created my own like personal best. So that was, it was like, we just coordinated that to transition to this last slide. So thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was perfect. I'm glad to help. Okay. That was awesome. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't schedule that. That just happened <clears throat> naturally. Organically. Organically, yes. So, I mean, and, you know, that's when we talk about strategies for movement baseline. So what does that mean? So um, before we make a change or suggest that we need to do more of something, figure out where you are. Right. So not based on someone else's standard, but for you figure out where you are. So, you know, Alan's point of we have most of us have phones. Uh, most of us have smartphones and not flip phones and um, that will actually track our movement. They're tracking more data than probably we're aware of. Um, but most phones have some type of health app on them that comes with them. There's a number of free apps that you can get as well. Um, you know, the, so it gives us this kind of objective number of, that we can look at ourselves and we can say, oh, on average, I move this much in a day. And you can also say to yourself, um, you know, um, part of 
exercise, or I should say part of movement in our environment, if our environment doesn't naturally invite us to move, we kind of have to make movement necessary, but most importantly, we have to make it fun. Right, so if it's not fun, we're probably not going to sustain it. If it's not, in, or maybe not even fun, but enjoyable. So having something that we can use to look at to say, oh, I, I moved this much, or it can be, you know, each time you move, you can hit your uh, your stopwatch, and it can just accumulate minutes over time. And then you look back in your day and say, oh, in 24 hours, if that's what we measure metabolism in, in energy expenditure, that non-exercise activity thermogenesis, I moved this many minutes. Oh, okay. Well, track that over a week and see what that average is. And then uh, go from there and say, next week, my goal is five more minutes in my week. But now I have an objective measure and I can repeat that, right? I can, I can go back and look at that source. Um, so smart devices do have their um, use. Uh, I would say that you don't have to have one necessarily. Pedometers uh, are still a very affordable um, type of tracking device. They usually hook on, um, you wear them. Uh, most of our phones have what are called accelerometers in them. And accelerometer, accelerometers measure more planes of motion. So pedometers are usually forward and backwards motion. Accelerometers will pick up side to side motions or change of planes like high to low type movements if you're doing things and you're wearing your devices. Um, interesting story uh, about pedometers. Uh, a, a friend of mine was doing a really large movement study um, about 15 years ago, and they got Got all these pedometers and they had about 3,000 people in their study. All these people had pedometers. It was in an urban area that they were looking at the benefits of walking related to cholesterol, related to some of the inflammatory health factors. So all these individuals were wearing pedometers and they started collecting the data and the numbers were insane. They were like, people were moving like 200,000 steps a day. Like, so you think about the equivalent more or less of 10,000 steps is about five miles roughly. So you think about the miles that people were doing. And so they were going back in going, what do these people do? Like, are they working in factories? Are they working in huge warehouses where they're walking like crazy amounts of miles per day? And what they learned, this is the where technology is not perfect, is that many of these participants were taking public transportation to work. And so they were on trains or subways or buses. And so they're wearing these pedometers and the, the bus is moving like this. When they're there, a lot of times they were standing and it was clicking steps, right? So these people are logging like all these massive steps and you know they weren't seeing the changes in the different health markers. So do you know the devices that you're using and what you're choosing? Um, because data just gives us this idea, right? It's not perfect. Just like think of them as estimates. Um, unless you're going into um, like a physiology lab and doing things like VO2 max testing and we're doing really specific targeted testing, and then we have those numbers, but otherwise just kind of use it as your general reference. So yeah, it, it was kind of- No, a, thank a, a you for story. that. Cause I leave my phone on my desk often. And so it doesn't count all my steps to the restroom or the copier machine or printer yeah. and all that. So I'm like, that's not fair. Yeah, you need to get one of those little holster things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, I love that. I, I, and again, everybody that's attending, please feel free to join the conversation. But if not, I have another question. <laughs> Go for it. So I know back in the day, like people would go and have their um, body fat percentage um, tested. And it was always said, like, you need to do the water dunk. Mm -hmm. And like now with those scales that have the sensors, is that accurate? And I'm, I know it's a little different from this, but I'm just all the things I'm thinking about as I'm getting ready to transition back to a real gym, I want to kind of find out where I'm at. Yeah, that's great. So the, um, the, so the water dunk you're talking about is uh, basically underwater weighing and for it, it determines with body composition and we're looking at how much, how much fat weight we are both essential and non-essential and how much muscle weight we are. And the combination of those two gives us this number called body fat percent. And the underwater weighing is still considered a very accurate or very low um, variability standard. But the um, gold, new gold standard for body composition is something called a DEXA scan. And uh, um, I'm hoping all of you in this session keep this in your radar. It won't happen in the fall because I don't think we're completely back online in the fall. But keep your 
buyout for spring of 2022. Gosh, that sounds so far away. Um, but we will actually be having a company come to campus uh, called Body Spec. And they are actually open now because I've had students go to them. Um, there's a couple different locations, Culver City, um, West uh, LA, somewhere. But if you go to bodyspec.com, you can actually go and you can get something called a DEXA scan. And it's basically an imaging that shows you one bone density, which is a kind of good piece of information to know what your bone density is. It's part of our composition. And it also tells you what your essential and your non-essential fat amount is, as well as your muscle mass. And so, oh, thank you for putting the link in the chat. And um, so you can go and get that done. Um, it's the, when people say, well, you know, is it exposure to radiation? That it is less uh, exposure than you get going through a TSA in secure, like a security at an airport. Um, so you can take, you can read more about the imaging. You just basically lay there on the table, it scans you and it gives you all of this information. So that would be, uh, you know, a good baseline when we're talking about baselines, when you're looking at what am I made of, um, that would be a great one for that. And that's the gold standard in the exercise physiology Thank world. Thank you. I'm making yeah. an appointment today. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And when you get it, let me know and we can go through it. Um, yeah, so other baselines, you know, could even be something like just keeping a calendar of minutes of movement or what you did and, and how you felt. So how when we're making movement necessary in our lives and addressing some of those barriers that you shared earlier, um, you know, how can we plug those into that WHOOP model and track those um, to address those inner obstacles so that we do feel that it, it, it kind of gives us that freedom in, in making that happen. Um, the other thing, just to comment on exercise equipment, if you use your exercise equipment um, for um, calorie expenditure or energy expenditure, um, do be cautious when you're doing that. Um, again, uh, it, most of the defaults on those are um, assessed at usually 170, 175 pound individual um, with a certain stride length. Uh, so you want to make sure you get to put in your information, your data, height, weight, uh, age, all of those things, the more details, the better. Um, if you are looking that that is expenditure, but you could use that as a baseline, like how, uh, how long can I walk on a treadmill at a certain incline uh, before I feel fatigued? And that could be your baseline that you could use. Um, or you could just use body weight even for baseline. So if your interest was to increase your muscle endurance, how, how much you can use your upper body muscle endurance, you could do things like a plank um, and you know get into a plank position and how long can you hold that? And if it's two seconds, that's your baseline, super. And then build from there, right? Then plug that into your WHOOP model and say, what, what's my wish? I want to do a plank for 10 seconds. Okay. So what's, you know, how do I break that down and make that part of a process? Um, and then um, the other uh, idea also for um, a good question, I'll come back to that. Uh, for um, ideas of fitness baselines or fitness assessment. Um, it's a website called exrx.net. And uh, exrx has lots of different movement information, exercise information, programs. Uh, it might be overwhelming. If it is, uh, feel free to email me and I, I'll, I'll dialogue about any specific questions with you. Um, but it does get some ideas of if I wanted to do more of this, what could I assess or establish as my baseline and then build from there and then revisit that? Um, how often do we revisit our movement or our our fitness goals if we have them. That's really specific to the type of fitness goal. Um, for most things, anything with our muscular system, whether it's muscle endurance, so how often we can do something or how long we can do something, or um, what it would be for uh, strength would be doing something maximally one time. Uh, from the physiology, from the adaptation standpoint, uh, it takes about four to six weeks before we really start to have neurological changes in our body to do more work. So you really don't need to be assessing that kind of stuff every day. Um, so get your baseline, 
start your behavior change and then revisit it maybe every four to six weeks. Um, and the same for like if you're walking, um, if we're increasing our minutes of walking over time, we would expect in a month or a month and a half of doing that different behavior or that new behavior that we would start to increase our capacity to do that. A question came up in the chat about good exercise recommending recommending exercise for bad cholesterol. Um, you know, that's a, a, I would prefer if you want to talk about that more, email me. And only because there's lots more that goes to that um, with that. Um, we would want to talk about stress levels and uh, what we eat and how you sleep. And do you have familial high cholesterol or hypercholesteremia? Um, you know, what is considered bad cholesterol? Are we talking about total cholesterols or uh, LDLs or HDLs? Uh, you know, exercise from a data standpoint, uh, any movement above rest appears to have benefits. It's going to take different amounts and different time per the individual. Um, and I know that sounds kind of like a really sort of default statement, but I think we're led in the popular media to believe that if we do one specific thing, everyone will have the same outcome. And we know that's not the case. Uh, it's so individual. Um, and it, it's pretty unique. So yeah, send me an email and I'm happy to talk about that. All right, so in the interest of time, um, uh, I guess this, so this is just a slide for the next session, but uh, just to wrap up, did anyone have any thoughts or was the WHOOP model new for anybody or was it something you've already used? Any other things? Throw them, share, put them in the chat. Any ideas? Everybody's quiet. I think anything reg regarding fitness and things get people are maybe more timid to join the conversation. Yeah, maybe. That's a big thing, you know, is. Um, OK, we got some. Good. Yeah. Never heard of Whoop. Yeah, Allison Whoop would be right up the alley of the Center for Wellness and Wellbeing. And Could Lee mentioned the newest there. part was the inside yourself part. Yeah, I never heard of that Whoop either, but it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, you know, the, the biggest thing is we is we have these preconceived notions in our mind that we have to do a certain amount of something for it to count. Um, but as we have less opportunities to organically move in our environments, how do we create those opportunities, right? And and knowing that any movement is a great place to start and, and it's getting, maybe that's the initial barrier for many of us, right? The thinking of, oh, it's not enough or, oh, it won't help or, oh, it won't this, but let that go, you know, and, and just do it, see how it feels. So yeah, my email's there. Um, you know, I, I love being part of our community and getting to know more of our community. So reach out, send me if you have questions or um, anything. I, I always welcome them um, and have any conversation. Uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time or making the time today to, to join us. So, yeah.